Welcome back. So today we'll be looking at chapter 4 and 5 of your Mastering Public Speaking textbook. Sorry that picture's a little grainy, but that's what I wanted you to start today with watching Julian Treasure's TED Talk and then reading those um, worksheets I've provided. I think Julian Treasure does a wonderful job of reminding us about the value of listening. Listening is kind of like dieting. <laughs> on several different levels. First of all, listening is something we know we ought to do. Most of us would nod our head along with Julian Treasure and say, yes, we have got to listen more to each other. That is the solution to world peace. That is how we're going to have a truly satisfying relationships with people. We have a deep need to be understood and, and we can provide that to each other by listening well. Um, but I do say that, it, that listening is like dieting. I can sit here and lecture you and remind you and give you all of these details, but at the end of the day, it's something that you just have to discipline yourself to practice. So we'll start off today in page 45. And uh, once again, I'm working from the assumption that you've completed those two worksheets, but um, so anytime you're listening to a speech, and we talked about this when we said that um, the mark of an intelligent mind is one that considers opinion a different from their own but doesn't necessarily accept it. Um, and I've seen it over and over again in speech class. As soon as someone talks about something like sex trafficking or um, something that's important but not necessarily always what people want to think about first thing in the morning, <laughs> you know, for giving a 9 a.m., 925 speech on, um, you know, uh, drilling for oil in Alaska, and it, it, it can feel sort of heavy, and, and it can be difficult to discipline our minds, and it's easier, right, to use what's called confirmation bias, and confirmation bias would mean that you're really only listening to the opinions that confirm your own opinions, your own biases, rather than considering opinions different than your own. So I just want to remind you that part of the reason that college has been a tradition for a very long time is giving you opportunities to maybe consider opinions different than the ones that you're were raised with, opinions different than the ones you may find among your circle of friends, and sometimes it takes a little bit of courage to speak up and say, you know, I've really been thinking about this thing, and maybe maybe it's not the way I used to think about it. Maybe I've changed my mind a little bit. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Up with the Squirrel. Uh, he, you know, he'd be having a normal conversation. That little collar lets the dog talk, and then all of a sudden he'll see a squirrel and say, Squirrel! Um, listening is something that we have to be actively pursuing, and it's something that even the best listeners, I don't care if you are trained to work for the CIA and you are a spy and you, you, you still listen what's called intermittently. Hearing is something we do continuously, but listening, actually disciplining our mind and, and absorbing information, um, that is something that is always going to be intermittent. Because our brain is doing is multitasking. It's always multitasking. So even the best listeners uh, will be intermittent. It is an active process. You have to actively engage in listening, and you have to discipline your mind. And a lot of you are, you know, perhaps in college, and you have to do quite a bit of listening. You have to listen all day long to your professors, to your fellow students, to your bosses, and it, it can be exhausting to listen. And so, uh, as always, we want to make sure that our tank is full, that we're not hungry or lonely or frustrated about something else. We try to come into any given situation as strong and refueled as possible. It's almost borderline impossible to listen unless you've had a good night's sleep and a good meal. So, um, overcome those obstacles to listening that they outline in your um, handout and in your chapter. Make sure that you are focusing 
on the big picture, that you're not letting your body or your mind wander, leave that stuff at the door, come into the room ready to listen. And remember that while people are giving a speech, if if I see that you're asleep or you're texting, I will take points off of your grade because part of this course is disciplining our minds to listen and being present as an audience member um, because that will contribute greatly to your success as a student in academia. So, um, Listening is not only something that we do in our classroom, but it's also something that's very, very important when it comes to interpersonal relationships. When I say interpersonal, I mean one-on-one -on -one relationships. This can be with a partner or with just your friends. Being a good listener um, can be the difference between having a meaningful relationship and having a superficial relationship. So superficial listeners don't really engage in the content. They don't hear the words behind the words. And one of the ways that you can sort of make sure, especially in important conversations, you know, have you ever had one of those conversations with people and you can just feel the gravitas of the moment and, and make sure, take the time to make sure that you understand what they're saying to you. Let me give you an example. When my husband asked my father if he could marry me, my dad actually missed it. <laughs> my husband was being so gentle and so sweet, and my dad kind of has bad hearing because he's an older gentleman. And so um, instead of saying, I'm sorry, can you repeat yourself? I'm not sure I understand. Um, he just kind of smiled and nodded and went his merry way. And then when my mom told him, oh, he proposed, he was like, what? I don't remember. We what? <laughs> He's kind of caught him off guard, which, I mean, it's not 1400s anymore. My dad didn't necessarily um, feel a need to give permission, but it's a courtesy uh, that my husband was extending that my dad completely missed out on. <laughs> so, especially if you are hard of hearing, but even if you're not, listening is a discipline. And we all know that sometimes as we talk, we're not clear. So just take the time to ask someone, reword it for them, paraphrase them, repeat, repeat it back to them. So what I'm hearing is, so what I think you're saying is, those sort of clarifying statements, those sort of um, affirmations to people will go a long way. Uh, they will feel empowered, they will feel listened to, and you wouldn't believe how far that can go in conflict resolution over and over again. It's not so much that they really want you to always understand the data, it's just to know that you care. If you're a boss, if you're a manager, and I assume if you're going through um, the college right now that that's kind of, you know, you'll be in an upper level position, never underestimate a quiet moment where you're genuinely considering that other person's point of view. Because if you don't get that, if they don't feel heard, if they don't feel respected, um, they're much more likely to act out and um, not be uh, working for you and for the organization, but to be prioritizing themselves. So take a moment to really hear to provide feedback, try to avoid jumping to a judgment too soon. I'm not saying don't judge, that's the next slide, is you can judge them. <laughs> you ought to judge people. Um, and I know some of you uh, have, you know, resist that. You say, I'm okay, you're okay. Um, and to that I would say, no, there are some things that are not okay, right? As a mother now, um, I need to discern the people that my son is going to be spending time with. I need to discern, is this the kind of influence I want to be around my son? Is it someone who I would be okay with my son growing up to be like that person? And I have to protect him, right? So I'm not going to just allow him to listen to anything. I do believe that there is some wisdom to hear no evil, speak no evil, um, see no evil. I really do believe that that what goes into our ears affects who we become in our character. So I say that all to say, um, yes, you ought to reserve judgment to a certain point, but at the end of the day, I think sometimes we um, 
can be tempted to sort of comply and become bobblehead dolls and go along with whatever's going on in our culture rather than stepping back and saying, is this okay? Is this something that we really want to endorse? And sometimes saying no is saying yes to yourself, to your family, to your convictions. So I'm never going to punish you in my class for saying no. I will ask you to say yes until you find a really good reason to say no. <laughs> Some of you, I often compare it to um, the magazine salesman. I tend to be, hey magazine salesman, come on in, have a seat. My husband doesn't even answer the door right? Um, doesn't even engage, doesn't even bother. So once again, this is a continuum of people who tend to judge someone and critique them and dismiss them or someone who, who opens the door to any magazine salesman and is so open to ideas that they don't have their own convictions. So you know, on that continuum, there are a lot of right answers, but I do want to challenge you to think critically to give, hear people out before you make judgments. And that's what good listening is. So once again, this isn't rocket science. Most of you generally understand these principles, but they're worth um, calling you back to your virtue, worth reminding you morally um, that listening is valuable, reminding you that in academia particularly, you're going to run into all kinds of ideas that you don't necessarily agree with. Um, please take the time to consider them. But then also know that whatever feels right for you, whatever you think is right in your heart, is your own conviction, and no one can take that from you. All right, so just another word on the demonstration speeches. Uh, remember, you're going to give us a process. You're going to demonstrate a process. So there should be a step one, a step two, a step three. Um, if there are more than five steps, you might have too big of a demonstration. So make sure that whatever you're demonstrating, that it's something you know, right? Um, don't teach us how to cook something that you've never cooked. So if that takes a little bit of real world getting your hands dirty, um, so be it. Make sure it's something you're passionate about. If it's the same thing as the humorous anecdote, if it doesn't bring a smile to your face, um, then maybe it's not the best topic for you. Uh, Doni Tamlin says that being funny is simply having fun and inviting the audience to have fun with you. So this is kind of a fun, lighthearted exercise usually. So find something that interests you, that you like doing, and invite us to join you in that. Make sure that it's at least five minutes long. Do not show us how to cook pancakes if cooking pancakes only takes a minute to explain to us. Now, if you want to talk about crepes and something a little more complex, then maybe that would fill five minutes. It does need to be simple. The hardest, the secret to the demonstration speech, in my opinion, is making sure that it is simple enough to be condensed into a five-minute speech, but complicated enough that it's not condescending to us as an audience. So if, if you're just teaching us something that we all already know how to do, it can seem a little bit like a waste of our time. So picking a topic for this one, I understand, can be a little more difficult, right? Not too common sense or too easy. And then make sure that the language, like we talked about, the jargon is something we can get. The one I see the most with unexplainable jargon is computer stuff. Um, you know, if you have that specialty and you think you can teach us how to put together a computer in five minutes, I can't tell you how many times I've seen that speech fail because uh, even though you understand it fully, it, it's not often easy enough to explain in five minutes. So what I would challenge you to do is maybe just pick something a little more simple. Maybe you could explain to us how to use an app rather than putting together an entire computer. Um, it's not a time just to show off, hey, everybody, look what I can do. It's also it's got to be something attainable or achievable for us as an audience. And maybe we have a room full of computer people and they can follow along, but that hasn't been my experience in the past. So analyzing demographics, moving on to chapter five. Demographics is something that if you go into marketing and business, you'll hear a lot about because when we're creating a 
environment, we are usually choosing a demographic to cater to. So this is Bar Louie, and I will go ahead and confess, I love Bar Louie. Part of it is that I love to shop, and it's right in the avenues in <laughs> Murfreesboro, where I can... Um, you know, get some avocado, you can just get some goat cheese, something a little different. Uh, and Bar Louie tends to um, appeal to other people in my de demographic. Often when I go in, it's people in their 30s, um, also have their shopping bags with them. You know, you pay an extra dollar for that little piece of fruit in your drink, but it's, it's a treat yourself kind of place. It's a little nicer. Right? So sometimes the demographic that they're trying to appeal to and we're, once again we're on page 57 so you can see kind of the different demographics sometimes they're trying to appeal to people in a certain culture of course if you're in and around Nashville you're gonna see lots of people trying to appeal to tourists right um, during uh, you know just certain seasons of the year their seasonal activity that appeal to certain fan bases, audience targeting. So if someone likes sports, they might go to a sports bar, right? Buffalo Wild Wings or the Double Tree here, and they know that the game is going to be on, right? And so with that, they know quite a few sports fans are uh, gentlemen, right? And so they're going to have pretty waitresses, maybe scantily clad. Uh, these are common tropes in the marketing of um, bars and businesses but there's a certain wisdom to it because they found you know how can I treat this one demographic right what is gonna make Emily Seal feel relaxed and comfortable well it's a little, little you know fruity glass of drink now if you hand my husband that same fruity drink in the top left hand corner it's not really gonna do it for him right he would much rather go to this fanatics place and um, that's not necessarily a gender thing. Some of you ladies have no interest in a piece of pineapple in your drink. So um, is your target audience younger or older? That's another thing to consider. Uh, you know, if you go into certain clubs, you can only be 18 or you have to be 21. Um, but a lot of places in a college town aren't going to try to put those age limits on it because they know uh, that there's a lot of money to be made in you. Uh, younger demographics, right? Uh, because you're out and about and having fun more than I am on a Saturday night. So another demographic to think about is cost, right? Cost. So if economic status, as it says on page 58, so if I come into Bar Louie, I'm probably going to pay extra money to have that nice environment. Now if I go into um, Silverados, they might have 10 cent long neck beers. And so they're appealing to um, a working class environment where people can drink for cheap. If I go to a club um, that appeals to like college students, they're probably going to have PBR and cheap drinks, uh, well drinks made with cheap liquor, right? Because they know their audience base, uh, a lot of them are new to drinking and don't necessarily. Um, care about having aged whiskey or you know scotch they're just interested in having a buzz and having a good time so demo economic statics plays a part in demographic profiling now let me just say another word because I know some of you and I, I know this because I teach this lecture all the time really resist demographics in fact it's kind of a mark of one of the Millennials Millennials is what we refer to those of you who are right out of high school that age group. Uh, you don't like to be put into a box. You don't like to think of age or social status. You really like to think of the world as a united uh, group of beings and you as an individual who can't be easily targeted to. And um, I think that that's fair. I think that just because I can enjoy a nice fruity drink at Bar Louie doesn't mean that I might also not enjoy a 10 cent beer at Silverado's because I am both of those people, right? I'm not just one neat, clean demographic. So, but uh, think about the people who are in your classroom, who you work with and who you um, are giving speeches to, what interests them? You know, if you are a back to school student, um, you have maybe have bought a house and maybe this room full of people they 
are thinking of buying a house in the next 10 years and maybe you have some wonderful wisdom for them and their security of that. Um, some of you younger students think about if you have a lot of um, different ages, a lot of diversity in the room, uh, you know, don't just talk about things that only interest you. Consider your audience. Consider the demographics of the room. Is it going to have a strong enough interest for everybody? Um, oh, I skipped ahead here. Hold on. Yeah, there we go. Sorry. Group membership. Now, group membership is something that can be helpful. Uh, if you say something like, hello, Murfreesboro, then the people in Murfreesboro are like, yeah, hi. But if you walk in and you say, hello, Murfreesboro, and we can tell that you are not genuinely from there and it kind of feels fake, once again, in some way disingenuous, uh, then we can kind of pick up on that and it doesn't feel, uh, it doesn't, it's not a buy-in. It's actually kind of like a, Ugh. Another thing to consider is, is this a captive audience or a voluntary audience? So if I walk into an assembly and I say, hello, sixth graders, they might be interested that I know that they are sixth graders, but many kids in a mandatory assembly are not there because they want to be there. Does that make sense? So appealing to a voluntary audience can be good but appealing to a mandatory audience while well, they already don't want to be there necessarily. So it's just something to consider. All right, so consider age. And uh, once again, we can be ageist, so we want to be careful. Um, but when you're giving a topic, make sure that the historical events and the references, if your audience is looking kind of blankly at you, make sure that you kind of catch them up to that. So if I walk into a room and I say, where were you when John F. Kennedy was shot? Most of my audience would go, I was not alive. I can tell you where my parents were, um, but maybe for this generation, it's where were you when 9-11 happened or where were you when Columbine happened? So always think about giving people context to things that you don't fully understand culturally. If you're giving um, a speech to a younger audience, always consider your vocabulary. When you come into my class, you can assume that the students in the room also have a college age vocabulary and we don't want to talk down to them. But if your audience is younger, if you're going to go into elementary education or something of the like, be careful about word choice. And then also, how does age affect our priorities? So. As I said last class in talking about inf uh, introductions, remember when I said never underestimate the power of self-interest? So what, when we look at, sorry, I was just gonna make sure it wasn't the next slide. When we look at what do people want at that stage in their lives? So like Eric Erickson's stages of development. So if you're right out of high school, you're still probably really looking for love and belonging. Right. If if you're right out of high school, you're probably really looking for loving belonging. So it, as you watch MTV, you might see these um, uh, these pimple ads. Right. And you're like, oh, I got to get rid of my acne so that someone will love me. Right. If if you're watching Nickelodeon, the kids aren't as interested in getting affection from other kids. You know, that's not um, they're not there yet in the stages of development. So it's just something to think about as um, you talk to your audience, what do they want at that stage in their lives? Uh, and how can you speak to them on their level? And so we're getting into talking about what we call psychographics. And that is what are the values? What are the beliefs? What are the behaviors and the attitudes that your audience is holding on to? And we want to avoid offending, if at all possible. As long as it depends on you, try to have peaceful conversations that focus on the issues rather than ostracizing people or um, offending them. So, um, you know, I had a student last year give a speech about gay marriage, and uh, he 
opened his speech by saying marriage was an outdated institution and it was no longer a viable um, means on which to build a civil electorate. Now, while I understand that, he knows I have a wedding ring right here on my finger. So saying that right out of the bat is going to kind of ostracize me as a listener and it's going to be hard for me to follow through to the rest of the conversation right now if he had started with equality or human dignity the right to human dignity rather than opening the conversation with um, a very opinionated and a con um, what's the word I'm looking for uh, a very judgy sort of uh, dismissive there's the word I'm looking for so we want to be careful about dismissing beliefs that are so different from our own um, and it doesn't mean that we have to believe what other people believe but it means that we're going to show respect and um, part of that is getting into enough empathy for the other person so that you're not going to um, be immature about stomping all over what they hold dear. All right, page 61. So we all have needs, whether we want to admit it or not, we are not self-sufficient. And the purple there at the very bottom of this, uh, we talk about those basic needs. And so this is perhaps why people in third world countries are not necessarily um, writing philosophical treaties because if we feel threatened on the basic needs level, it's very hard for us to think in a high-minded way. If we're worried about having enough gas to get to school, we're probably not thinking about long-term goals. Because we're so busy focusing on our short-term goals. Moving on to any given speaking situation. So when you're asked to speak, at a place other than our classroom. In our classroom you have the advantage of being able to walk into the same room with the same people starting to get to know your audience but there will be times when you'll have to go in blind. You, will, you don't know how many people you're talking to. You don't know how big the room is. Always come early. Always show up. If you're supposed to speak, come early. I used to run when I taught high school I would kind of help speakers and I can't tell you how many people would show up at the last minute and then say oh well where's your PowerPoint you know I, I needed a smart station well you didn't say that in any of our emails and you know this, so always please do um, be a considerate performer come in early uh, make sure that you know if you're going to be mic'd if you're not going to be mic'd what's the size of the audience what type of occasion is there going to be food served because that can be very distracting you need to give a different kind of speech if there are going to be so many distractions in the physical environment timing 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 how long have you been asked to speak if you are a professional speaker this needs to be your first question right because if you're supposed to talk for 20 minutes and they have this little luncheon every month and they always have guest speakers and the guest speakers always supposed to start talk for 20 minutes when you get to minute 22 you're gonna start losing your audience because it's what they're used to and it's an unwritten rule that you as a performer really need to understand um, is how long are they supposed to give you uh, if you see people starting to tune out tell them I only have another minute I understand these speeches are usually 20 minutes um, you know if you are coming into a church and that sermon length is usually 20 minutes once again try to keep it and respect what that environment and what those people are used to um, but you know every church is different some churches speak for longer some churches speak for shorter so always know um, try to know what's going on beforehand but you can always do some audience profiling on the fly just know that you that's a limited endeavor you can look around the room and say oh these are uh, maybe an older audience you might be able to say well I'll try to be more conservative because that's what I would do for my Nana right well, that might not be a fair conservative you might have a room full of older hippies <laughs> 
<laughs> you never know. So um, if you need to do some audience polling, by a show of hands, uh, maybe talk to people before you start your speech is always a good thing to work the room and kind of make connections if you can. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to sort of give a speech on the fly and off the cuff. So anyway, that's chapter four and five. Like I said, these things are um, not exact sciences. You can do all the polling in the world and all the testing and it doesn't necessarily guarantee your success because you're not in their brains. You can't make somebody listen to you. You can make them hear you. You can, you know, pin them down and scream in their face. But even then, especially then, doesn't mean that they are truly listening to you. Your audience is sort of like trying to fly a kite. Have you ever tried to fly a kite? You got to get the wind just right. You got to hold the string just right. There is a science to it but it's not a predictable science. So marketing, you, you never know what's going to sell and what's not going to. And it takes a certain amount of risk. It takes a certain amount of creativity. It takes a certain amount of courage to put yourself out there and hope for the best. So all of these things will happen as you give your speech. It, it'll take a little bit of courage. You got to tell the truth and hope that people hear you. So as always, thank you for listening.